welcome to our panel discussion. I'm here with Marty, Anne, and Justin. Um, we're going to be discussing systems and supply chains within the product and material life cycles. So while we know there's many places to intervene within a system, um, it can often be challenging for companies to understand where that is and where to make, they can make the most impact to drive change throughout their supply chain and the larger system of the product life cycle. Um, what are some strategies that companies can use to prioritize sustainable decisions? Well, there's a lot of different ways of answering that, depending on what kinds of drivers you're, uh, those, those companies are responding to, So, which, as we'll be talking about in, in some of the other sections of this um, discussion. Uh, several key drivers are consumers are, having, uh, are finding access to a lot more information about chemicals and a lot more research about the harms of chemicals in products and materials. Uh, there's a lot of division, uh, a lot of drivers by retailers. Retailers are starting, re retailers and um, people who make final products are starting to push on their supply chains and saying, you know, what's, what's in the chemical or product that you're providing me that I'm now putting in my end product and putting out into the market. Uh, increasingly, there are, there are more regulatory uh, drivers than there have been with uh, reach in Europe and with uh, Tosca and state uh, legislation on specific chemicals as well as chemicals more comprehensively in the US. Um, so those are some of the key drivers, and then we're also seeing investors starting to say that if you're in a uh, in an industry segment that is dependent on chemicals that are likely to be regulated in the near future, that you are not a good uh, investment going forward. So those are some of the key drivers that, that we're seeing. So those would probably drive companies to prioritize certain things uh, within their products. So if, if you are a consumer-facing brand, for example, you're going to be driven a lot more by uh, what consumers are concerned about in your products than some of the others, whereas if you're a component manufacturer, you're going to be driven by the final product manufacturer that you're selling to. I think also what can help to prioritize decisions and actions is companies can reach out to uh, different consortiums or learning uh, communities. Mm -hmm. um, at Northwest Green Chemistry, uh, we've sought to develop a uh, product toxicity assessment roundtable with uh, a few big names, and I think this sort of learning community can help people understand other companies' perspectives and, and what tools they've used so that they can come to um, agreed upon decision or make changes that make sense um, for the uh, particular material that they're working with. Yeah, one of the other things uh, that we've seen as investors going out and talking to both the incumbent players as well as the new startups is we found it really helpful to take within a sector what are some of the themes where there's uh, a lot of momentum right now. Mm -hmm. So in addition to thinking about, OK, what are the chemicals that are most of concern, also layering in onto that, what are some of the other life cycle impacts? So one of the things that we've seen, say, in the textile and apparel sector is water is both uh, a problem in terms of its use, but it's also the carrier for a lot of the chemicals of concern. So if you can address, you know, use a technology that addresses water use, but also uses a safer type of chemistry and doesn't have any emission of that chemistry into the environment, all of a sudden that's a, a new technology that's going to have multiple drivers mm -hmm. supporting its adoption mm -hmm. within the industry. And it also takes the conversation beyond just chemists. It takes it into the manufacturing realm, into the design realm, and that's good because as, as investors, but also as people just trying to promote uh, a better world, we want to have as many options on the table as possible. So we found grouping those things by sectors and drivers within each uh, sector of the economy to be really valuable. That makes sense. And I think to Justin's point, thinking about leveraging, like within an industry, if we think about electronics industry, leveraging what other companies are doing and what kind of drivers are within that already, and then looking to other key players to kind of adopt some of the things that are working for them. Um, so with that, do we um, see any initiatives that are bringing industries together to kind of talk about best practices and how to affect uh, sustainable change within their supply chains? Uh, there are both uh, within sector and across sector. So the two cross sector uh, groups that I'm familiar with, and I think my colleagues here are as well, are the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council. And while there is a, a lot of benefit, no question, about working within your own sector, because you have a lot of the same uh, core chemical problems and supply chain communication issues, it's really helpful to talk within Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, for example, with leaders in other sectors, because you find that there's a lot of stuff that can be abstracted out particularly in, in terms of communicating up and down the supply chain. Um, there's a lot more in common across sectors than one might imagine, so that's one. The other place is the Biz NGO Roundtable for Safer Materials and Chemistries, um, and that does both within sector and within uh, materials classes work. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so the plastic scorecard, for example, is something my colleague Mark Rossi and I put together trying to evaluate the hazards of, of input chemistry in, in polymers. Um, so a lot of work is happening there within the sector as well. Well, and the plastic scorecard is a great example of that can be leveraged by many different um, Correct. industries, right? That was our intention, yeah. So those kind of tools and then benefiting um, a lot. So. Um, one of the things, too, is really, so it sounds like there's some initiatives that are driving communication. I've also heard that trying to work with your supply chain, especially with how diverse supply chains are getting these days, mm -hmm. is how, what kind of strategies could be needed or what efforts to really reinforce communication and understanding of what's happening. So if you're thinking about, I'm a manufacturer of an electronic product, a mobile phone, and then how do I know how it's being recycled or what's happening down there? How do I know what those actors are doing within my supply chain? And kind of how do, would I control that or influence it positively? So thinking kind of about, um, I think first thinking how we can really um, improve communication through that, kind of what kind of initiatives could really help understanding um, what decision, decisions are made. Well, you, you talked about uh, managing end of life, mm -hmm. um, that's part of it. Um, one initiative that I thought was pretty cool was it, that happened in Seattle. I think they recently mandated that plastics be a certain color for whether it's biodegradable or recyclable. And so in that way, it sort of creates an indicator for the consumer to be able to uh, manage it in the correct way. So there's that sort of thing that could help um, inform the, the consumer. I think education is important. Um, yeah. That's and one way. Within the supply chain, there's some nice examples that can potentially be abstracted. Within the built um, in products environment, mm -hmm. there's something called the healthy product declaration, which the intent there is it's a way to share a bill of materials along with the associated human and environmental health impacts along the supply chain. So it's a, a format that everyone can fill out and transmit up and down the supply chain so that the uh, while it might have more information than any one person needs, it has all of the information that someone would look for and it's in a standardized format so that you can find things quickly. I think the other tool that's been really powerful uh, within sectors is uh, consortia coming together to either agree on things like a manufacturing or product restricted substance list. Mm -hmm. So you see this a lot in the apparel industry. You have a sustainable apparel coalition and the zero discharge of hazardous waste, the ZDHC coalition, both of whom have kind of come together around around sets of chemistry that they're interested in. Um, you see similar sorts of lists coming out of health and beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's uh, th those are another tool. They're a crude tool, but it's a tool that starts getting people to ask the questions right. that my colleagues are talking about. And, and those are specific within sectors to certain kinds of chemistries and hazards. But there's also just communicating data on chemical data up and yeah. down the supply chain. And there's a couple of great examples of that. One is the IMDS from uh, the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. And you were asking earlier, you know, how do you start Start making an impact on your supply chain, and I think that's where it, it's helpful to have a sector-wide consortium. Um, so 20 some years ago, the auto industry got together and said, look, we all have the same suppliers and we're all asking them the same questions about the chemicals and materials they're giving us, so let's put it all into one database. It's easier for the supplier and you're more likely to get more accurate information. Um, and you know, it, it, it's not something you want to you don't really want to be on the market, you know, you don't want greater toxicity to be part of your market differentiation. You yeah. want, so that's something that you don't really have to worry about sharing within your sector. So that, that's a key thing, you really come together within a sector to try and find chemical information, consistent chemical information. Yeah, it's been amazing in the places where it's been implemented, mm -hmm. just that act of gathering and sharing the mm -hmm. information often leads to better uh, decisions being made. Things like uh, harmful carbon black pigment that weren't necessary being taken out of products because no one had asked why it was in there and a lot of the people didn't even know it was yeah. in there. And so out of certain mm -hmm. products, just this, this act of disclosing is enough to start driving us towards uh, a better materials palette. And then that starts interacting with the regulatory drivers. So for example, the state of California Safer Consumer Products Program mm -hmm. has put together a list of a list of lists, as it were, <laughs> of all the things that we can agree acro across a whole series of sectors are bad actor chemicals. We do have, we're missing a lot of information about chemicals on the market, but these are the ones we know about and we know are problematic. 
Um, so the idea of putting the 2,300 or so chemicals together is that no matter what sector you're in, you can look at that and say, okay, I want to avoid this class of chemicals, so I'm not going from BPA to BPS and having another toxicity issue, that I'm actually shifting away from the less safe chemistries. And that's going to be a consistent market signal across a bunch of different sectors. Mm -hmm. And I think that is that last point is worth uh, reiterating, that whole notion of taking a class approach, so that in the absence of data, recognizing that if the last three perfluorine chemicals you made were all harmful. Maybe the next 260 that you make are also going to be harmful. Yeah. Um, those sorts of uh, extensions of class, they're not uh, strong enough to um, merit regulatory action, Correct. but they may be strong enough to merit uh, consideration by a designer mm -hmm. or right. uh, selector of chemistry. So one of the things that we do see, despite the lack of information for some chemicals, is that by drawing analogy, we can can be proactive. And so taking a, a, a class approach often helps simplify this universe of uh, something like 2,300 chemicals yeah, down to six or seven um, chemical classes of concern. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a nonprofit organization uh, called the Green Science Policy Institute who has uh, sixclasses.org that mm -hmm. talks about six of these classes of chemicals that share um, uh, chemical actions or chemical structures that people might want to avoid. And frankly, there are just classes of, of materials and, and chemistries that are problematic across a bunch of different sectors. If we think about adhesives, uh, dyes and pigments, you know, these are going to be problematic whether it's in a textile or a plastic or whatever. So it's, it's, it's interesting to start thinking about it that way and start coming up with alternative chemistries that would work for those different functions. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the consolidation, too. So you're saying that not every industry is doing it, but you have this class of chemicals, and every industry can leverage, um, kind of going back to even the plastic scorecard, right? Kind of mm -hmm. some of that stuff. Um, so I think also thinking about, um, are there examples of companies that are doing this really well, that are doing material and chemical disclosure with their suppliers and really kind of um, trying to get the toxics out of their products? One of the places oh, uh, that we've seen a lot of action, and I think it makes sense because it's such an intimate contact, so personal care, mm -hmm. there's a ton more disclosure, mm -hmm. even at the consumer level, than you find in other sectors. And what's great is even if the individual consumer doesn't feel empowered to make a decision based on that ingredient list, you have things like the Environmental Working Group Skin mm -hmm. Deep Database that can help interpret this. And I think that's one of the things that we some guys get pushed back on, like, oh, people don't have a PhD in chemistry, how are they going to interpret an ingredient mm -hmm. list? But when you do that, you find that there are other organizations who do have the technical expertise to help people interpret it. So whether it's something like EWG or The Good Guide, having that ingredient disclosure, like there is in uh, Health and Beauty, really drives uh, the consumer empowerment. Mm -hmm. So personal care is one sector. Um, we're also seeing it in textiles, footwear, and apparel. Mm -hmm. uh, Nike is one that's leading a sustainable apparel coalition we've mentioned before. Um, there's other groups that are looking at their supply chains and trying to figure out you know, some of the safer ways of going about material classes, again, because they're using common material classes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier to look at them uh, across that uh, platform. Yeah, and another sector is is definitely 3D printing. Um, you know, people are eventually going to be bringing these printers into their home and manufacturing yeah. inside their own homes. Um, and so they they want at Autodesk they uh, open source their uh, their formula, mm -hmm. um, both for materials developers to be able to uh, adjust their formulas for their printers and to try to understand what potential alternatives exist um, for the resins that go into the printer so that people at home using these printers can feel confident that they're not exposing their children or mm -hmm. themselves to toxic chemicals. We're also seeing efforts in the building material industry, as we say, with mm -hmm. being driven by the U.S. Green Building Council and some of its standards, the LEED standard. That's a big driver for that industry. And that and auto, I mean, those are the two most complex consumer products that you can think yeah. of. They touch all these other supply chains, metal, electronics, textiles, glass, you know, wood, anything you can think about goes into a house or a car. Yeah. And electronics has been forced to do a lot more because of the metals um, uh, part of it. So mm -hmm. there's now a lot around conflict minerals and mm -hmm. rare minerals that's driven a lot of disclosure, maybe not of the entire uh, device, but of, but of components in that device. We know a lot more about it now. 
and that gets back to not thinking just about end of life, but where are we sourcing these materials mm -hmm. and where are they yeah, coming absolutely. from, right? Um, so thinking about bio-based materials as well. Um, so one of, is there a company that's doing a good job as far as disclosing information, or a supplier disclosing information, chemical ingredient? I mean, I know that when I've worked with companies, that was one of the big um, barriers was kind of getting that material information so I could do product assessments or hazard assessments on those kind of chemical ingredients. So, so are you saying a company at the end, somebody who assembles the final product or, or a supplier? Um, yeah, um, a manufacturer getting supplier data. Getting supplier data. Yeah, so supplier data can be hard to, to come up with. Mm -hmm. um, in cases where you have enough members of uh, a particular industry, so like sustainable right. apparel or the the folks doing healthy product declaration in the built environment, they can often put enough pressure on to, to get the information out. The other thing is that information is is hidden. It's not completely, it might be a, a not available to one tier down in your mm -hmm. supply chain, mm -hmm. but at some point, if you produce a chemical, you have to at least send a, a MSDS or material data sheet uh, with certain information on it. Now, especially with uh, the new globally harmonized standards, mm -hmm. there is less and less that you can leave off that sheet. Um, you can still leave certain things off, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's decreasing the number yeah. of things you can leave off of it. So if you can get back in the supply chain to where you can locate these the SDSs, uh, yep. SDSs mm -hmm. then you're able to build it back up. The problem isn't that the information doesn't exist. The problem is that it's so diffuse yeah. and that there's not a driver to bring it back together. So That's unless right. you have an infrastructure like the auto industry yeah, that helps organize it, it's it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that whoever you're talking to doesn't have access to it because the, whoever they're talking to doesn't have access right. to it because it's, it's hidden somewhere. And as supply chains get you know longer and more yes. complex, that's harder and harder and that's true for every sector that we've talked about today. So. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our videos and panel discussion. Um, you can find out more information on the website for the Berkeley Big Top 10 event. <laughs>